The secret to a lower score is a better short game. There's a reason they call it the scoring zone and you're about to learn how to score. In this edition, we cover all the bases from 100 yards and in. You'll discover techniques you can use immediately with everyone guaranteed to take strokes off your score. Our PGA professionals will share their secrets for hitting every shot from a full wedge to a tricky three-foot putt. This video features techniques and tactics from two of America's top instructors. Bill Forrest, a PGA Teacher of the Year and Head of Instruction at Troon Country Club in Scottsdale. And Kevin Weeks, an Illinois PGA Teacher of the Year and the Director of Instruction at Cog Hill Golf and Country Club in Chicago. With the techniques revealed by our PGA professionals, you'll be pitching with precision, chipping straighter than ever, putting for accuracy, and getting up and down out of the bunkers more often. You'll also discover some great techniques and games that are guaranteed to make your practice time more effective. Be prepared to discover secrets and techniques that are sure to solidify your short game, making you a better player immediately. We've got a lot to cover in this edition of the PGA Golf Instruction Video Series. So let's get started with PGA professional Bill Forrest, who has some valuable tips to help you when you're in the scoring zone. The National Golf Foundation tells us that regardless of age, gender, or skill level, 65 to 70 percent of our shots on the golf course are 100 yards or less. 77 percent of all golfers learn the full swing first. 77 percent of our children weren't born walking. 77 percent of the tennis players I know didn't learn how to serve in their first tennis lesson. So every motor skill is taught or learned small to big, except golf. I'm a believer in learning the short swings before we learn the long ones. I'm a believer in learning the game small to big. So I'd like to teach my students how to control distance early on in their golfing careers. This I call a quarter back swing. This I call a quarter finish. I start them off with short swings, short clubs, and short stances to hit short shots. I then lengthen the swing to what I term half. Half is when the shaft is at right angles to the, the backward arm, and you finish with the same length on the front side of the swing. For a longer club, I would ask them to take that same half of backswing and then pivot and rotate a little bit to get to three quarters. A little wider stance and a little bit more rotation takes me to full. If it's full on the backswing, it's full on the through swing. So I'm simply a believer in making everything relative. You have a short shot, you take a short club, you make a short stance, you make a short swing. You have a long shot, you take a long club, you make a long stance, you make a long swing. Everything's relative. I also like to teach the, the swing in different speeds. I like a soft tempo that I call 20-20 to take something off a shot. I like a medium tempo that I call 40-40 for a normal shot. And I like a little faster tempo, 60-60, to give it a little bit more oomph. Try taking four clubs and hitting them all the same distance. Here at Troon, we're, we're uh, lucky to have some yardage markers and some, some plates like this where you can change lengths and change speeds and understand and self-discover how you can control distance by having more than full swing and full speed. 65 to 70 percent of all golf shots are within 100 yards of the flag. Practice controlling distance with short swings. Swing with same length on backswing and follow through. Control tempo of swing to control distance. I see two main problems with amateurs chipping. First, a shank. The shanks come when the club's coming too much from the inside, causing the hosel of the club to hit the golf ball, making the ball go off low right. The second thing I see is chunks. The club coming down, hitting behind the ball, hitting, then hitting the ball. To cure your shanks, we're gonna do two things. One, we're gonna take a towel and put it under your arms. We're gonna keep the towel in as we make the stroke. This is gonna ensure that your body 
keeps turning. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to put a 2x4 right by the toe of your club. You'll take your normal chipping setup, the handle in the center of your body, your sternum and your nose forward, and make your normal shot where you don't hit the 2x4. If you hit the 2x4, your club's coming in from the inside. If you drop the towel with the left arm, you're coming too much from the inside. If you can do these two things, keep the towel between your arms and not hit the 2x4, you'll never shank another chip shot again. I just showed you how not to shank your chip shots. Now I'm going to show you how not to chunk them. I've just drawn this line. A chunk shot happens when you stay back on your right side and the club hits the ground before the ball. Now, if you place your right foot on a paint can, this is going to set your weight on the left side. The handle is forward. This will set your nose and sternum also over your left side. As you make your back swing, keep the club face looking at the golf ball, hitting down, turning through. If you notice, the divot now is in front of the ball. If you'll do this, you'll never hit a chunk again. Practice chipping with a towel under each arm, not letting it fall during swing. Practice chipping next to a 2x4 without hitting the board. To eliminate chunks, keep weight on forward side. Hit down so that the divot is in front of the ball. In a typical golf school environment with 12 students in the class, I'd start off by giving them a little quiz. I'd walk them ar around the green, drop a ball here, ask them what they would use on the golf course from here to that flag, drop another ball over there, ask them what they would use from here to a different flag, keeping track of what I thought were the correct answers. Collectively, with five scenarios and 12 students, they might get 15 or 20 correct answers. So in 30 years, in 40 plus countries, I've never ever had a group that passed. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to teach you a system, a system that's a three club system based on creating a picture of how you would toss a ball and then simply selecting the appropriate club and shot that duplicates the picture. You don't have to buy into it, but it's better than the system you've got because you don't have one. Now some people are going to teach you a system that says when you're this far off the green you would you would use this club. When you were this far off the green, you would use this club. When you were this far off the green, you would use that club. That only takes in account one variable, that being the distance from the ball to the edge of the green. I'm going to show you the variables, the four variables, that help you to decide what club to use, and then I'm going to use your creativity and your imagination to make the right selection. The first variable is the lie. What you have to ask yourself is how will the lie affect the ball's performance? We have three balls within six inches of each other. One ball is going to go shorter than normal. One ball is going to go a normal distance. And one ball will actually come out a little bit hot like a flyer and go farther than normal. This is the ball that's the hot one. It sits down in blades of grass halfway down and there's there's no friction between the ball and the golf club. There's actually a little bit of lubrication. The ball won't roll up the face. It'll come out with top spin. This ball sits up on top of blades of grass and needs to be, the club needs to be elevated so that we can pick the ball off the top as if we were picking it off the top of a tee. This ball sits all the way down and needs to be gouged to get out. It's going to go shorter than normal. The other variables that we need to take into consideration are air time. Airtime is the distance between the ball and where it's going to hit the green. So in this situation, I have a toss that has much more airtime than ground time. We're going to define that as a pitch, and we're going to use our most lofted club, which is our 60-degree wedge, our lob wedge, or a sand wedge if needed. The third variable we're going to define as ground time. Ground time is the distance between the ball and where it's going to hit the green. Here's a situation where I have much more ground time than air time. We're going to define that as a chip, and for that shot, we're going to use a 7 or an 8 iron. If you have three balls and you're tossing them around the green, they can only do one of three things. They can have more air time, they can have more ground time, or in this case, 
Here's a situation that's about 50-50. That we call a lofted chip, and for that we're going to use our pitching wedge. Your brain doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. So if you can create a picture of tossing the ball, ask yourself this question, is the ball going to have more ground time, more air time, or be about half and half? Then you can select one of these three clubs. The chip is hit with the seven iron, that's more ground time. The lofted chip is about 50-50 air and ground, that's with your pitching wedge. And then you have three pitches with your lob wedge. You have a low pitch, a medium pitch, and a higher pitch or a lob shot, all with your most lofted golf club. Create a picture of how you would toss the ball and simply identify the appropriate club and shot that would duplicate that picture. Four variables for club selection. One, lie. Two, air time. Three, ground time. Four, 50-50 air ground time. I really like Bill's advice using the three club system. And now that he's explained it, let's see it in action. We understand the three club system. We understand that it's based upon a premise of gathering information with your eyes, creating a picture of how you would toss a ball, and then selecting an appropriate club and shot that would duplicate that picture. We now need to learn how to hit the five shots. The two shots that I'm going to hit here are the two lowest the chip and the lofted chip. Whenever you need to hit a low shot on the golf course, you need to do these three things. Whether it's under a tree branch or under the wind with the wind in your face, you choke the handle of the golf club, you narrow your stance, you play the ball back in your stance. The handle leans forward as does your weight. I feel like about 70% of my weight is into my left foot. Some of the things that I see with the average golfer is that when they're asked to put their weight on their left side, they do it from the waist down, but their upper half tilts backwards. So it kind of looks like this. Lower half left, upper half right, it's counterproductive. You can see with the use of this board that my shoulders are level here, and not only am I into my left side from the waist down, but, I, but my spine is in front of the golf ball, and I'm into the left side from my waist up as well. Some of the common errors, the head needs to be delivered to this impact bag and to the ball the same way that it starts. In other words, in a race to the ball, the handle must beat the head. I see an awful lot of setups that look like this with hand action that looks like that. One of the remedies is to use an impact bag or to take an extender, have it avoid your left rib cage and take some practice strokes without hitting your ribs. If you put too much right hand into it, you're gonna, you're gonna break a rib with your weight falling backwards. So remember, the ball is back in the stance. The handle and the weight are forward, and we use a very simple putting stroke. For the pitching wedge and the lofted chip, the, the setup and the stroke are similar. What we know about the pitching wedge, though, is that with the same action, the ball will roll the same amount that it flies, so the ideal landing spot for this shot and this club is about halfway between ball and hole. Now let's go to the other side of the green and learn how to give the ball some loft with our lob wedge. We've learned the two low shots, the chip and the lofted chip, with the seven iron and the pitching wedge. Now we've got to learn how to hit three different pitch shots with our lob wedge, our 60 degree wedge. We're gonna hit a low pitch, a medium pitch, and a high pitch. Now if by definition a pitch is a shot that has more air time than ground time, it could be 60-40, it could be 75-25, or it could be 90-10. We need to be able to control trajectory with our lob wedge as well as distance. To control trajectory, all you have to remember is that hinge equals height. If you don't need any height, you don't hinge, and you use the nun-nun stroke. So for the low pitch, we play the ball back, we lean left, and we use that same wristless putting stroke. To give it a little bit of loft, we have to add some wrist hinge. But where we add the wrist hinge is the important factor. We're gonna play the ball more in the middle of our stance, get our weight 55% into our front foot, or our, in my case, my left side, instead of 70. And on the back side, I'm going to hinge. I'm going to get the club above my head. 
On the front side of my swing, I'm gonna take the hinge out. So to me, it feels like hinging on the back with my hands and an arm swing on the front without my hands. What I see most people doing is having no wrist hinge on the back side and then trying to add loft with plenty of wrist hinge on the front. This is not a spoon, a scoop, or a shovel. It's a golf club. You don't add loft to the golf ball by hitting up on it. You actually add loft with a combination of a downward blow and the loft of the golf club. So remember, we're going to play the ball in the middle of our stance, even out our weight a little bit. You can even tend to lean it forward or, or get the ball a little bit forward of center. We're gonna have plenty of wrist hinge here, plenty of wrist hinge here. And to back out distance, you can slow your stroke down a little bit. So it's kind of like a long, wristy, full swing, one quarter speed. Some wrists on the back, some wrists on the front, makes that one some some. We've got three shots with the, the, lob, with the lob wedge, three different pitches. Low, none, none. Medium, some none. And the high one, some, some. It's kind of like learning Cantonese. To hit a low shot, play ball back in a narrower stance. Lean club forward, weight on forward leg. Hands through the ball before club head. Hinge equals height. Low shot, none, none. Medium shot, some, none. High shot, some, some. I see a lot of students pull their cart up to the side of the green, grab a golf club or two, walk to their ball. They've gathered no information, they have no plan, and they probably have the wrong club. So after I've chosen my club using my three club system, I'm going to go over to the halfway point between the ball and the hole, gather some information, visualize trajectory, landing spot and roll, and then come to my golf ball with some information and a plan and the right golf club. Here I've chosen two of the three clubs from my system and I'm not sure which one I'm going to use until I get to the golf ball. If you have indecision as to whether to use a seven iron to chip perhaps or a pitching wedge to loft, lofted chip, always choose a club that has more loft. If you choose a club that has the lesser amount of loft, you might try to add loft to it. By choosing the club that has more loft, you can give some loft back. It's always better to give loft back than it is to try to add it on. So I've got a landing spot in mind. I've chosen a, an old cup that was cut uh, halfway between myself and the hole. I'm going to take my pitching wedge and hit a lofted chip. My stance is narrow and slightly open. The ball is back in my stance near the inside of my right foot. I'm going to choke the handle, lean it forward, put about 70% of my weight into my left side take a couple of rehearsal swings, and I'm gonna base the length of my rehearsal swing on my landing spot, not on where the hole is. Step into the shot, get myself set, and think about duplicating that practice stroke. I find myself in a little bit of a different situation here. I've got a little more air time to cover between ball and landing spot. I've got a little less ground time between landing spot and the flag itself. And I'm a little bit below the surface of the green. But once again, I've chosen a couple of clubs from my three club system. I've gone to the side, viewed trajectory, landing spot, and roll. And I have a plan in mind. Because I've lost sight of the, uh, the mark that I chose from the side, I'm gonna try to fly the ball to the front edge of this bunker, which is my landmark and my new landing spot. I'm going to decide between these two golf clubs once again. The uh, pitching wedge is for a lofted chip. The lob wedge is for a low pitch. In this situation, I'm gonna choose the club with more loft and give a little bit of the loft back. I'm gonna try to fly the ball about 60% of the distance and let it roll the latter 40. Once again, I take a couple of practice strokes based on my landing spot or the landmark on the side of the green. I step into the shot, play it off my back foot on the inside of my right heel, lean the handle forward, take a little bit of the loft off, 
slide my hips and my body left so that about 70% of my weight is there. Get into the habit of walking from your golf bag to a point halfway between the ball and the hole. View the shot from the side. Visualize trajectory, landing, spot, and roll. Don't go from your golf bag or your golf cart directly to the ball. Gather some information, have a plan in mind, and then come to the golf ball itself, rehearse it, and execute the shot. Walk to halfway point between ball and hole before going to ball. Visualize trajectory, landing spot, and roll. Pick landing spot on green or a landmark off the green if necessary. Well, you've probably found yourself in a situation just like this with a big hazard between where you are and where you want to go. And you've probably had your playing companions offer the advice, just ignore it. Well, that is far easier said than done. How do you ignore it? How do you pretend it's not there? Well, we certainly know there's more to this game than just hitting shots. Every touring pro finds a way mentally to deal with the tough shots, the tough holes, and certainly the tough golf courses. One of the best ways I've found is to go ahead and acknowledge the trouble, but then visualize the shot that you want to hit to get over the trouble and be specific about the trajectory, the flight path, what the ball is going to do when it lands, and how it's going to finish. And in the process, you find a way to focus on the positive and eliminate the worries of the shot at hand. And when you get over the shot after looking at it and visualizing it, never lose sight of that shot in your mind's eye. I'll give it a go here. Jack Nicholas called it going to the movies. Your playing companions might just call it unbelievable. What we have here is one of the toughest shots in golf. You've got a visual of water in front of you to the green. Could be a bunker, could be a ravine, deep rough. This shot you have to play as if the obstruction is not there. Focus on your target. Focus where you want the ball to go, not what the obstruction is. Make sure you take enough club to fly the trouble. If you have to take more club, that's fine. A chip from the back of the green is better than hitting the ball from the hazard. Now, to hit this shot, look at your target, back at the ball, and make your golf swing. If you'll follow these steps, you will lower your scores by taking the big numbers off your scorecard. We're 100 yards from the green. We've got water right, bunker right, water long, a bunker on the left side. Most players play too aggressively in this situation. They try to get too much out of their wedge, hit the ball in trouble, and give shots away. The best thing to do from here is to divide the green into thirds, a front third, a middle third, and a back third. Play for the third of the green the pin is on. Assess the situation you've got. How far are you? Where's the pin? If it's in your wheelhouse, you feel really comfortable, go ahead and play for the front third or the middle third. Be careful with the back third. At all costs, keep it out of the water. Keep the target in your mind as you address ball, not the trouble. Focus on the positive, where you want the ball to land. Be sure to take enough club to clear trouble. Don't be overly aggressive on greens surrounded by trouble. Ask any group of golfers which shot they most dislike, and chances are they might say the bunker shot. One of the reasons is there's no set standard of what you're going to get in a bunker. The consistency of the sand may change. One day it may be wet, the next day it may be dry, and the lips vary greatly throughout a golf course. Add to that the fact that none of us practice these shots as much as we should. Well, this might be your lucky day. One quick tip, when you hit bunker shots, you want to release the club as much as you can through. Almost throw the club at the back of the ball because you want to use the bounce of a sand wedge. Now we'll go to Bill and Kevin, who are going to give you more advice and tips on how to improve your bunker play. Bunker shots made easy. To a lot of golfers, this is the most difficult shot in golf. I don't think it's so tough. 
Three imperatives. You have to use the back of the golf club when you hit a bunker shot. You can't use the leading edge because if you do, it'll dig in, causing those ugly, thin, and fat shots. The sand needs to displace the golf ball and slide through the sand. Secondly, ball position. We have to shift our weight to our left foot. If we do, the club will always bottom out in the center of my stance, use this little intersection to test your weight shift. If my weight falls backwards, it bottoms out early, causing those ugly, thin, and fat shots. How much do I dig in? Well, I dig in a little bit with my toes. If I dig in like some of you, I can't shift my weight through the ball. And lastly, I must hit sand. I don't want to hear the clunk of the golf club hitting the golf ball. Now with the ball position, if we know the club bottoms out early in the middle of our feet, if I want to hit one inch behind the golf ball, I simply play it one inch left of center. If I want to hit three inches behind the golf ball, I play it three inches left of center. For a long bunker shot or a shot in coarse, wet, and shallow sand, I play it in the center. For something that's got sand that's deep, dry, and fluffy, I play it three inches left of center. And for average sand like this, I'm going to play it about an inch and a half left of center. Use my weight shift to have the club bottom out in the middle and try to hit the sand onto the green. It's that simple. Most of you amateurs hit your bunker shots fat for two reasons. The first one, you dig your feet in way too deep. All you need to do is put your feet in, wiggle once, that's all you need. Secondly, you get the club picking up way too much. We've got a board here that's been painted red. The board's gonna show you where your club enters the sand, if you use the front edge or the back edge. This is what you do. Most of the club comes up, When it comes up, the front edge hits the sand, causing your club to go deep into the sand. Now that I've shown you how not to hit the shot, I'm gonna show you the easiest way to hit a bunker shot. I'm gonna take a shaft, I'm gonna place it right on the angle at which the sand wedge sits to the ground, place it in the bunker. I'm gonna take my set up, just like we did in the last one, barely digging my feet in. I'm gonna make a back swing, making sure that this shaft matches that one. And now the club hit the sand on the trailing edge, which will prevent it from digging and will get the ball out of the bunker. If you'll use a simple board and shaft to get your club on plane and hitting the sand in the right spot, you'll become a better and more consistent bunker player. Use the back of the club when hitting a bunker shot, not the leading edge. Shift weight to forward foot. Dig toes in only a slight depth. Keep club on plane for more consistent bunker shots. What I have here are the two easiest bunker shots that exist. The first is the uphill lie. When a tour player has an uphill lie on television, he's thinking about holding out that shot. It's that easy. The motion itself is like sticking an ax into the side of a tree. You're going to take this golf club and bury it in the sand behind the ball and leave it there. We're gonna tilt our spine so that our shoulders are parallel to the ground. We're gonna get a little bit into our left side, lay the face back, bury it in the sand. The second is the buried line. Believe it or not, this is an easy golf shot, unless you have it right underneath the lip. If it's underneath the lip, your best bet, take it out sideways, hit it on grass, hit your next shot off grass. We're gonna play this ball back in our stance. We're gonna play it off the inside of our right heel. We're gonna lean into the hill, put about 90% of our weight on our left foot, take all the loft off the face by leaning our hands, pressing them in front of our left knee, we're gonna cock it up and stick it in the ground. This one comes out with top spin and releases. The two easiest bunker shots that exist are the ones that you think are the hardest. What we have here is a long bunker shot. We've got a lot of green to work with. We have a low lip. We have firm sand. 
A lot of people would come in and hit this shot with a sand wedge, making a full shot, trying to hit an explosion shot. I'm gonna show you a safer, easier shot that'll help reduce your score. What we're gonna do is we're gonna play the ball back in our stance, just like we would for a chip shot. The ball is gonna be right of center. Your sternum and your nose are gonna be in front of the golf ball. The handle of the club is gonna point at your belt buckle. Your weight's left, your hands are left, your head is left. We're gonna start our swing by keeping the club face looking at the ball. Hit it like we would a normal chip shot. Holding our finish, making sure the hands are ahead of the club. That's a shot that will definitely lower your scores. For uphill bunker shots, swing club like you're chopping wood with an ax, leaving club in the sand. For buried bunker lies, play ball back in stance, lean club forward, and chop at the ball. Use a pitching wedge from bunker if you have a low lip, a lot of green to work with, and firm sand. One of the most useful shots in golf, and one of the coolest in my opinion, is the knockdown shot. You'll see tour pros use this a lot to access tough hole locations like on a back plateau or to hit shots underneath the wind or to get out of the trees. You can use this shot with some success if you do a couple of things in your setup and one very important thing in your downswing. When you're getting ready to hit a knockdown shot, you gotta move the ball back in your stance and you have to move your weight forward. One other thing that'll help you is if you lean the shaft forward a little bit. And when you make your backswing, keep your weight on your forward foot. And once you've done that, on the downswing, the most important part to hitting this shot correctly is maintaining the angle in your right wrist when you get up to the ball. To do that, you have to move your right side into the shot. Don't release the club, because if you do, you're going to increase the loft and you're going to increase the bounce, and there's no way you'll hit this shot correctly. Let me show you what I mean. Now let's go to Bill Forrest and he'll give you some more advice on how to hit the knockdown shot. If the object of the game in darts was to throw the dart through the board, dart players would throw darts like pitchers throw baseballs. But instead, they put some resistance in their motion to give them accuracy and control. With your short irons, you need that same accuracy and control. So my belief is in putting resistance in to give you that control. I'm going to hit a little knockdown shot here and I'm going to do it with an abbreviated golf swing. You see the players on tour hitting partial shots into the green all the time with their short irons. It not only gives them spin, but it gives them that accuracy that we're looking for. I'm going to change my setup a little bit. I've got a wedge in my hand. I've got uh, about 75 yards. This is about a 120 club for me. So I'm going to shorten my backswing a little bit and I'm going to abbreviate my finish. In my starting position, I'm going to back the ball up a little bit. I'm going to play it back of center or nearer my right foot. I'm going to slide my knees and hips to the left to put a little bit more weight on my left side. And now I feel like I've leaned the shaft forward and I'm a little bit ahead of the golf ball. Abbreviated uh, finish is my biggest concern. The length of the backswing will control distance. Watch the tour players on television put some control into their short iron swings by abbreviating those swings. Watch them hit partial shots and watch them have the ability to control trajectory as well when the wind's against them. So learn how to shape your shots, learn how to control trajectories, and learn how to hit partial shots before you learn how to make full swings. Swing with resistance in your motion and an abbreviated finish. Set up with ball back in stance. Slide hips and knees forward. Lean shaft forward. Do not release your wrist through the shot. Treat knockdown as a partial shot for control and accuracy. There is no question that technology has changed the game we play and will continue to do so. It has not only changed the equipment, but it has changed the way we train and practice. PGA professionals are a great source of the latest technology and training aids, and through their help, we can better understand how to apply those to our own game. Coming up, there are two training aids that may change your swing and your game forever. 
technology could shave a few more strokes off of your score. What we have here is the latest in putter teaching technology. This is the cutting edge system that uses ultrasound to track your putter. It's got a microphone right here. It's hooked to a battery pack that sends a signal to the receiver. Receiver through the fire wire into your computer. It tracks 28 parameters in your putting, some of which are your putter face at address and impact. Most people think where they are is square when actually they're to the right or left. This device will prove to you where you are. It also will track your path, your rotation, the rate of your rotation, and most importantly, it tracks the speed at which your putter swings. Using this, we're finding that PGA Tour players, putter swings back and through the same length and the same speed, where most of the amateurs take it short back and give it a hit. Got two really good drills that will help you learn to square your putter face up at impact. The first one's using a golf glove. You place it between your left elbow and your body and you hit putts with it. If the glove stays into your body, the face will stay square. But most people are gonna, the elbow's gonna come out. When the elbow separates, the putter face is open to the path. The next drill is using your right hand. Simply hit putts with your right hand only, swinging the putter head at your target, and that will help you square your face also. Typically when we talk about golf clubs, you talk about driver, fairway woods, now hybrids, irons, wedges, and putter. And when you talk about golf equipment, there's several parts that are made up. You've got the grip, the shaft, and the head, and within them you have the length of the club, the loft of the club, the lie angle, the weight, the flex, and the bounce. And what we, we, we're focusing on here is the, the short shots from 100 yards in. So what we typically talk about with lofted lie is you look at a long iron, it has lower loft, three iron, one iron, and as you progress up through the set, it becomes a wedge or a lob wedge, maybe as much as 60 or 64 degrees. When you talk about lie angle, if it's proper, it's pointed at the target. If the club is too upright, it's pointed to the left, and if the club is too flat, it's pointed to the right. It affects centeredness of contact, which also affects distance, trajectory, and consistency. As a club fitter, we've also got some pretty interesting tools that help us do our job today. We've bought one of the latest models. It's a Doppler radar-based tracking device that when you hit a golf ball, it actually physically tells you data from the ball, such as ball speed, launch angle, spin rate, carry, and even guesstimates that roll. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit a shot for you today. We have a target out there at about 100 yards, and I'm gonna go ahead and hit a shot, and then we'll look at what information it gives us on the, uh, the radar screen. All right, come on, let's take a look. So that particular shot that we just hit, the ball speed was 82.6 miles an hour. It launched at 29.9 degrees. It had 6,762 RPMs, and it went 106.2 yards in the air, 5.2 yards left of target, and was coming down at a vertical landing degree of 46.1 degrees. Place a golf glove between your forward elbow and body when practicing putting to help keep your face square through impact. Practice putting with rear hand only to aid in keeping face square. Contact your PGA professional to find out the latest in technology training available at your course. In order to play your best golf, you've got to get creative, but you also have to learn to read your lie and a shot like this, I'm about 20 feet short of the green, I can use any club, but because my ball has settled in an area where the grass has been mowed really tight, I would never recommend a wedge for a recreational player, or even for a tour player for that matter. A better choice might be a three wood, a three iron, a seven iron, or a better choice yet might be a putter. The good old Texas wedge. And I can tell you that a good rule of thumb is, for every five feet you're off of the green, 
add about a foot more to the total length of your putt, and that becomes your target. A little practice, and I promise you, you'll save par more often. Remember, you can use any club from anywhere around the green, but you always want to look for the high percentage shot. Now let's check in with our PGA professionals, and they tell us all how to shave more strokes off our scores. To putt or not to putt? Should I use the Texas wedge? Well, I've got a little bit of an uphill slope here, and it's very quick from the edge of the green to the hole, kind of cross grain. If I asked my students what they would use, oftentimes they would choose a putter from here. When asked why, they would simply say, if I hit a lousy putt, I'm going to be closer than if, if I hit a lousy chip. I suggest they learn how to chip. But in this situation, I'm going to try the hybrid. Why? It's got about 18 degrees of loft when my putter only has four. It's going to get, get me through this cross grain and longer grass a little bit easier, but I'm going to stroke it just like I would a putt. I'm going to raise the handle a little bit, get the heel off the ground, apply my putter grip to it, play it a little bit back in my stance, standing tall, a little bit, little bit of weight on my left side, and then I'll just stroke it like a putt. So don't go with the theory, pitch when you have to, chip when you can't putt. Learn how to chip and putt. Don't use your putter as often around the green. And in, in a situation like this, try the hybrid over the putter. Bill just showed you how to use a hybrid from off the green. Some of you might use a seven iron, a little chip and run, might go too far. Some of you are gonna use a wedge, try to flop it up. That shot could check and you'd wind up short. I'm gonna show you a way to get the ball rolling quicker so you can hit it close consistently. We're gonna use the Texas wedge. We're gonna play the ball a little back of center, about a half a ball back of normal, and then we're gonna make our normal putting stroke, making sure that the putter swings the same distance and the same speed back and through. There's alternative ways to hit the shot. Find which one is best for you Practice it and use the shots you have the most confidence in. This will help you get up and down from around the greens more often. When using a utility club from off the green, choke down and use a putting stroke. When using a putter, backstroke should equal follow through in speed and distance. Be sure to practice using these clubs from just off the green. Ever walk up and find your ball in a spot and think, now why did it have to end up there? This is certainly one of those situations. This ball is right up against the collar and no club looks very good behind it. With the putter you think, well I can't get that to the bottom of the ball and a wedge, well that's enough to strike fear in anybody. But a shot that you can hit that involves the wedge is the bellied wedge. Now let me tell you how to hit it. You want to use your putting stroke, so use your putting grip. You want to hover the wedge off of the ground, and the reason for that is you want to strike the ball in the middle of the ball with the sole of the club. Let me show you how to do it. Use your putting grip, as I mentioned, and your putting stroke, and the ball will come out much better than you would expect. Now here's Kevin with more advice on how to chip from awkward lies. We're faced with a tricky shot here. We've got a downhill lie, green running away, balls up against the second cutter rough. This is a hard shot. Some people would try to hit a wedge. They do, they're gonna hit behind it. Some people might try to putt it with a hybrid or even putt it with a putter. If you try that, putter's gonna get caught in the grass behind it. The ball's not gonna get out. The easiest way to hit that shot is put your putter, hit it with the toe of the putter. The putter's designed here to swing up and down to hit the ground behind the ball, getting the ball rolling. To hit this shot, you'll hit, take your normal putting setup, except you're going to address the putter on the toe. From here, take a normal putt, practice this with your putter before you take it to the golf course, but this is an easy alternative to a tough situation. When putting from up against the collar, try the belly wedge striking the center of the ball with the sole of the wedge. 
Hitting the ball with the toe of the putter instead of the face eliminates resistance to collar grass. For either of these alternative techniques, practice them first. I hate to three putt and I'm sure you do as well, but I can tell you one of the surest ways to eliminate three putts is to become a better lag putter. Let me tell you a few things that'll help you do that. When you find yourself with a long putt, stand up taller, grip the putter a little bit lighter and don't change the grip pressure throughout the stroke. Take a little longer backstroke than you otherwise would and don't make an effort to accelerate, but rather let the weight of the putter just drop on the back of the ball. Let me show you what I mean. Now putting is one of the most important aspects of the game. Whether you hit a 300 yard drive or make an eight foot putt, they count the same. And yet, this is one of the areas where you can make improvements in your score the quickest. Now Kevin is gonna show you how to make those pesky little downhill putts in the center of the cup. We're faced with a downhill putt here. I see most players miss hit this for three reasons. One, they grip it really tight, trying to control the putter. Secondly, they get the stroke going real long and slow it down coming through, which opens the face. Another way I see it missed is they try to use the toe of the putter. The easiest way to hit this is to make your normal stroke, keep it short, keep some momentum in the stroke. A great drill that will help you with these tricky downhill putts is to place a quarter in the back of your putter, keeping the quarter in as you make your stroke. This will ensure the putter is swinging back and through the same speed. When faced with this shot, make sure that you have light grip pressure, a short backswing, a short follow through, maintaining the speed of your stroke. This will help you conquer the tricky downhill putt. For longer putts, stand up taller to the ball. Three rules for downhill putts. One, use a looser grip. Two, strike ball on center of the face. Three, even tempo back and through. I'm not gonna say speed is everything in putting, but if you improve your speed, you've gone a long way towards becoming a great putter. And one of my favorite drills at improving someone's touch involves improving their tempo. Let me tell you how to do it. Next time you go out to the practice putting green, get a series of balls, and as you putt, try to count one, two. One going back, two going through. The idea is that you don't wanna have any acceleration, but just a gradual speed up as the stroke progresses. It goes like this. One, two. Try it again. One, two. You want a consistent flow to your stroke. And when you do that, you'll have consistent speed. Now for more drills and tips on how to improve your putting, here's Bill and Kevin. Tempo in golf is very, very important from your putter all the way up to your driver. So with the putter to have a true pendulum-like motion, the putter needs to work back and through, same length back, same length through, same speed back, same speed through. I'm a believer that every, every swing in golf should be equidistant on both sides and have an equal speed as well, with the exception of a specialty shot. I've got a 20-foot putt here and 10 golf balls. This is called a ladder drill. I'm gonna hit the first ball to the collar where the cup is, and then in two foot increments all the way back to here, I'm gonna hit those 10 balls. Gives you a fine tuned sense of controlling your pendulum like motion. Takes away some of the pressure in your grip. Gives you the ability to rock your shoulders. When you hit the putts, if you pass the ball in front of you, you've got to start all over again. So find out at your golf course what time it gets dark because this isn't easy. But I guarantee you that once you get good at it, you're gonna be able to control distance on the putting green a whole lot better. 
You're a golfer. How wide's the cup? It's four and a quarter inches wide. This cup happens to be two and a half inches wide. And I'm going to use these three balls to practice my short putting. It narrows down the focus a little bit and really helps you with your short putts. Oh, it's not easy. If you don't have a hole cut like that at your golf course, simply use a water bottle. It's the same diameter. It'll really help you with your short putting. Toughest putt in golf has to be the side hill downhill. It's so tough, I've got three cups cut here instead of just one. But if you can think of it this way, if you can see every putt as being a straight putt, it makes it a whole lot easier. Every putt is a straight putt. The ball is point A, Point B is the point that we read to allow for gravity and the slope to curve the putt. So we get our directional read from here. We get our distance related read from the side and we can see that it's a little bit downhill. So I'm going to move this point farther back, that being point B, and I'm not gonna try to putt the ball in a straight line from here to there. Gravity and the slope's gonna curve it into the hole. If I hit it too hard, it's going to go in the cup on the left. If, if it loses its speed, it's going to go into the cup on the right. Let me give it a try. Let me try it from the other side now. I got lucky there. Now I've got uh, myself on the other side of the hole with a completely different putt. Once again, I'm going to read the putt from behind to get some directional information and find point B, which I think is a couple of inches above the hole on the right edge. I look at it from the side once again to get a distance related read and I can see that it's uphill. So I'm going to move this point further up the hill. I'm going to aim my putter to point B and then my eyes are going to transmit a me message to my muscles that tells me not to hit it to the hole but hit it to a point past the hole. If I hit it too hard, it'll go in the cup on the right. If it loses speed, it'll go in the cup on the left. Lost its speed. Give this a try. Uh, if you don't have three cups like this cut at your golf course, put three, three water bottles down. It'll really help you with side hill putts. And remember, every putt is a straight putt. We've got a great drill for you that'll help you make more three footers. These are the putts that give the amateurs problems, and this drill will get it where you'll have no fear. Take a simple three-foot metal ruler that you can get at any home improvement store. If you need to, you can drill a hole in the end of it to keep the ball in place. You'll take your setup, look at your target, eyes back, stroke it, this is a simple drill that'll help you make more putts. Most amateurs putting strokes go out and across the golf ball. I've got a great drill here that'll help your putter path not go out and across. You'll take a chalk line. After you determine the line of the putt, you'll pop the line down. You'll put a tee six inches behind the golf ball right on the toe of your putter. You'll come three inches forward and put a T on the heel of the putter. You'll now make strokes where you don't hit either T. That drill will fix your path and you will definitely make more putts. Use practice drills to add consistency to your putting. The latter drill will fine tune your tempo and distance. Every putt is a straight putt from the ball to your determined target spot. A three-foot metal ruler is a great aid for mastering three-foot putts. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of the PGA Golf Instruction video series. There was a ton of useful information, and working on your short game is a great way to start taking strokes off your score immediately. The key to a great short game is practice. And the great thing about practicing your short game is 
you can do it anywhere from the range to your backyard so use all the tips and techniques in this video and start lowering your score today see you in the next great edition of the pga golf instruction video series